In this video, I'll show you how to make this simple primitives animation in After Effects. I'll also talk about one important thing you need to be aware of if you haven't used any 3D renderer yet. Hi, I'm Adam Bennett. This is the video shop. I use these basic primitives that I exported out of Blender. You can find a list of my resources in the description below. At the end, I'll give you my thoughts on the new renderer. There were a couple of big things that I bumped up against though. I actually nearly gave up at one point as I couldn't understand what I was doing wrong. To be honest, you'll probably roll your eyes when you see what it was, so stay tuned and have a good laugh at my expense. Okay, let's get started. So we'll start off by bringing in a couple of models that I've textured the Netply in Blender. Taurus Terrazzo Slab and Pyramid Quartzite Denali. They sound like albums from a fictional prog rock group. After Effects puts them in their own folders, which I do not like, so I'm gonna just tidy this up and put them in their own dedicated folder. So if we drag one of them onto the new comp icon, it's gonna give us this model settings pop-up. That's gonna come up every time you bring in a new 3D model. We'll come back to this, but we'll just okay it. And if now if we check the comp settings, we've got an advanced 3D renderer, which is the one that we want. We've got these things enabled and these things disabled. After Effects really with one hand giveth and the other hand taketh the way, but we'll come back to some of these a bit later on. That's fine. I'm just gonna change the frame rate and duration and okay that. Right, so I'll just rename that and we'll pull in the Taurus now. So again, you get the same, the same pop-up. So with the advanced tab here, you just wanna be aware of how big your object is in the real world. So for this scene that we're gonna create, maybe the spheres are the size of footballs. It's not something we need to worry too much about with this abstract scene, but definitely if you're doing a pack shot of whatever for a product demo and you're adding specific cameras into the scene, just be aware, aware of how big things need to be. So I'm just gonna okay that. So if we get a camera in here now, and switch to two views. And I'm just gonna bring in a solid just so I can see how big these objects are. Uh, so I might scale down the pyramid. Something like that. So I've exported .glb files. You can also use gltf and if you've got the beta version of After Effects, .obj's. I'm not really interested in file formats, if I'm honest, I'm not an expert on them. I downloaded both formats of this Apollo 11 command module and they both look the same to me and they're probably the same file sizes, but just something to be aware of. Okay, so back to our silly shapes. If you want to go into your model settings at any point, the shortcut for model settings is the same as solid settings, shift control Y and that'll bring up this model settings tab here if you need it. Depends on how you want to animate it, if you want to flip the axis or whatever. Okay, so next let's go to light in the scene. So I'm gonna right click new light and we want an environment light and we want this checkbox cast shadows on. So can't actually see any shadows right away. Uh, if you have the same thing, uh, go into your render options and what this does is allows us to control where the shadow is being cast from. And I spoke to Victoria at Adobe, so thanks to her for bearing with me with some uh, pretty tedious questions. Apparently the renderer is voxel based. Look it up. I guess to save on memory, it will only cast shadows where you specify it within this box. I'll come back to my thoughts on this. Look forward to that. But basically, at the moment, perhaps because of what I've been working on before, if we look from the top and go into these render options, this is where the casting box is over here. So our shapes are actually within that, that box at the moment. So we can click fit to scene and that box is gonna snap to any of the shapes that we've got in our scene and now we can see that we've got shadows there they're not looking great at the moment that's fine because we have options for that uh, so all of these options here are for shadows and the more that we bump up these amounts so the smoothness goes to 32 the render quality goes to 300 from 
my <laughs> and that's my fan worrying now uh, as it <laughs> struggles to render the scene. Right, so I'm actually going to click on Draft 3D for the sake of my fan not worrying like a jet engine. I probably need a new computer. So what you're probably going to want to do when you bring objects into After Effects is go into your render options and just experiment with whatever settings are the sweet spot for what looks good and what your computer can perform. For me, about sort of like 40 or 50 render quality and maybe smoothness of say 10 and then leaving it on this resolution of uh, 16 MB. While I'm working, I might drop these down. So actually, let's just do that for now. Just set these to be really low values. And then, okay, so obviously the shadow looks god awful, but my fan is not kicking in, so that's good. That's our default light. We wanna get an HDRI in here. So I've already pulled in some here. And if I bring in this, Small studio, HDRI, doesn't need to be turned on, but now in the source, we can now select that HDRI. And it's not looking great now, but again, if we just check, say 30 and 10, so that looks okay, but to get a proper idea, I probably want to get a studio floor in and some other objects. So let's just magically skip ahead. So with our environment lights, the options are kind of limited, but you know that's fine for this sort of thing. So you can rotate the HDRI. I'd stick to rotating it on the Y, which is sort of like the whole studio being on a turntable that you're just rotating around, but uh, each to their own and obviously you can bump up or down the intensity and the shadow darkness if you want to. One thing to bear in mind is the shadows are disabled on all other lights apart from uh, environment lights. You can still use them in your scene. So here I've got a couple of lights off to the sides, but you need to bear in mind that they're not gonna be cast in shadows. By the way, when you've got all these lines in your comp window like this, shortcut shift control H is your friend. So it's very easy to turn them on and off. So I'm just going to switch to Draft 3D again because um, otherwise my computer is going to start making noises. So one positive is that it is pretty quick. So we've got we're at full res and it's updating pretty quickly. So I suppose that's a plus performance-wise. But when you come to keyframing, I definitely recommend switching to Draft 3D. Otherwise, your computer is probably going to struggle. Hmm. And yeah, one thing I've just noticed is this extended viewer. I think that's new, is it? And uh, also 3D ground plane. Hmm, okay. So before you start keyframing, um, another thing we need to bear in mind are these uh, render options, which by the way, you can access here or sort of the normal control K renderer and then options exactly the same. When you're keyframing, you do need to be aware of this casting box. It kind of sounds like a more depressing version of the casting couch. I'm not a fan, if I'm honest, although I'm sure there's very good reasons uh, for having it this way. Let's say you want to make sure that your casting box uh, sort of encompasses the whole animation. Okay, so we've got these shapes keyframed, from back there in Z space and then they're sort of coming forward. So if we pick this frame here, go to go to render options, we can see where the box is. So it's sort of uh, cutting off half of this curved box here. Now, if we click fit to scene, it's gonna snap to where those two shapes are, but obviously that means that it's not encompassing back here either. This may not be something that you bump up against at all, um, it might be, I haven't, I haven't seen anyone else struggling with this. And like I say, if you're just bringing in a model, rotating a camera around it for sort of like a pack shot or whatever, then you're probably gonna be fine. But if you're animating things over a large area in your scene, this may be something that you need to sort of uh, factor in. Anyway, once you've got your head around that, you can do the fun part of animating your shapes. 
going to assume that you don't need me to walk you through how to keyframe things, so we'll just fast forward through this bit. One issue that I encountered, which you might get, is I open up one of my projects the next day and some of the models are blank. If you purge your 3D cache, which is here, and it's not the same as your normal cache, this should fix the issue. Another thing I want to mention is apparently Michael Ponch has come up with a method for cheating depth of field. Uh, I haven't used it myself yet, but his video is always good value, so that might be worth checking out. So this is the final scene, and I'll leave it on draft 3D and low res for now, just in case my computer dies. Talking of cheats, to get around the whole shadow casting box issue, I've actually got the camera pushing into the shapes rather than the shapes moving away in Z space. I know, genius. And then in the scene, I've got a couple of adjustment layers. So there's one that's just giving the shapes a little bit more contrast and vibrance. And there's one on the background. And if I bump it up to, if I bump it up to full res, just to make the shape stand out a little bit more. Don't judge my lighting, I'm just playing around with this. Both of these adjustment layers are referencing an alpha mat layer. So alpha mat and inverse alpha mat. And I mean, just very quickly, because I don't want to repeat what um, Jake Bartlett's already done, but just grab the calculations effect, select say the first shape that you want to mat and then bump up the opacity and set that to copy. Just gonna isolate that so we can see what we're doing. I'm gonna put a fill just because I get confused easily, uh, just so I can see that it's in a, a matte layer. Then you'll need to repeat this process, but basically grab the, the second shape in the list, but then uncheck preserve transparency and set that to normal. And then you basically just need to do that same step for all the other shapes. That's fine for making adjustments to all the shapes, but what if I wanted to just adjust the contrast on the box, for example? It's not going to work because it's not it's not taking into account any shapes that are in front of it or it being behind other shapes. If you really wanted to do that, you could do it with pre-comps. There's a distinct lack of 2D integration with this, so you can't even, if you wanted to say darken the background and the studio floors, the bottom layer, so you couldn't even add a 2D layer and drop the opacity to say 10. The shadows are just gonna disappear. Another thing we lose is reflections. So if you wanted a reflective floor, for example, you might think that you could just drop a, a 2D solid underneath the shapes, um, but we don't have a reflection option. And if we bump this up here, we get this. So to make the animation timing easier, I've used linear keyframes and animated everything over 10 seconds. Then I pre-comped that and then done the animation timing with time remapping. I've done a whole tutorial on this, so I won't wang on about it here. And that gives us this. So that's it for the tutorial part. A couple of minor roadblocks, but it was fun to play around with and I'll definitely explore it more. One thing that's immediately exciting is that it's now very straightforward to play around with simple 3D and After Effects. You can very quickly grab a model from, say, Sketchfab and create something which looks all right with just an HDRI and a bit of love. They've got a really interesting collection of scans from museums, for example, which are free to use. So you can animate this bust of George Washington or um, this big wooden structure or Daniel Day-Lewis's head. Exciting times, anyway. This isn't about an army of ignorant 2D motion designers stealing the work of dedicated 3D artists. It's about having more options when you want to engage viewers with your work. Some of us just aren't experienced or even particularly interested in modeling or texturing, so this opens up different possibilities for us. Obviously the quality is nowhere near that of dedicated 3D programs, and that brings me to a very small criticism. I do think that there's a chance that until this feature is tweaked and updated, it could gently nudge some motion designers into other software. I personally wanted to play around with just simple primitives, but I had to dip into Blend to do that. I know there's, say, Substance 3D, but it's currently £40 a month here in the UK. Perhaps After Effects should include the ability to add these to a scene within the software itself. There are, after all, third-party plugins to do the same thing. So I found myself spending quite a bit of time getting familiar with basic modelling and UV maps in Blender, 
And the irony of learning free 3D software to create models to import into paid software wasn't lost on me. Speaking of importing your own models, let's talk about the problem that I kept bumping up against. Some of the models that I was bringing in looked like this. I tried moving and swapping out the HDRI and adjusting the shadow settings, but nothing was working. The other models looked okay and I couldn't figure out what it was. I reached out for help and eventually figured out what the issue was. I re-exported the models without the bump mat and they look fine. As I've said repeatedly, I'm not a 3D expert, so this is verbatim from one of the developers at Adobe. Normal maps should work just fine. It's a matter of getting the bump height info into the normal map. I've done this using Blender shader nodes for baking or by using Substance Sampler, which has a height to normal function. There's also almost certainly ways to do this in Painter and Designer. So there you go. Huge thanks to Victoria at Adobe for enjoying my endless questions and general bitching and moaning. I know they're keen to hear how people are getting on with this feature, so do comment and leave your feedback. And that's it. Thanks for watching. See you again soon.